Welcome to the Shun Podcast, where we expose religions that use shunning as a tool to control people. So quick business before we get started. Uh, as you know by now, I offer one-on-one coaching to help people recover from life in these high control groups. I work to help people grieve the past, find themselves, and then find the life that they actually want, not just the one they were given. I'm actually offering something special for the month of February as a trial. So if you want to work with me, now would be a good time. I'm actually offering pay what you want pricing. You know, that's not something you see very often, but I want to work with more people. I want to try to help more people. So, you know, when you look at a traditional therapy locally is usually what a hundred dollars plus per session. Uh, Online therapy is usually $80 or more. I typically charge $50 for coaching, which most people find reasonable, but this month I'm actually letting you decide the price. So the minimum is actually $20, but you decide from there. And by doing so, I'm hoping that I can help more people. So if you're feeling unhappy or stuck, send me an email at shunpodcast at gmail.com or reach out through any of the websites that I have, whether it's shunpodcast.com, xjwhelp.com or whatever. And let's start working together. We already lost so much time in these groups. Uh, You can certainly do some healing alone, of course. But, you know, when we, we work together on things, we can often heal a lot faster And, you know, we can also process things together, challenge perspectives, get new tools, find ways of uh, different ways of looking at things, find acceptance, kind of go through this grieving process together. And in the end, you know, more and more people have been reaching out for help and seeing people that I work with actually start to find their voice, uh, to make big changes in their lives, to to be who they've wanted to be or to just be proud of who they are. You know, that's the best feeling in the world. Speaking of seeing people become who they are or, or, you know, be able to speak to who they've been, uh, today we actually have another brave person that's reached out to tell their story as part of the process of healing. It can be very cathartic to share your story with other people, to feel seen, heard, validated. So let's go on a journey with today's guest. As you listen, look for the lessons, look for the ways that maybe your story relates and Maybe you can learn about what what has worked for this person or maybe what hasn't. Uh, Maybe it's something that you can pull into your own life. If you were never involved in these groups, uh, you know, I get emails from people that just listen because they find these stories interesting or they find them inspiring. So please help spread the word. Uh, These aren't just cult stories. These are human stories. So many of the things that were experienced by the guests of this show are found in other areas of life. So share these episodes and let's help shine a light on the human experience. What's really going on in this world, you never know who it might help. So without further ado, let's go ahead and meet today's guest. My name is Derek. I'm 34 years old. I was a Jehovah's Witness and I am shunned. All right, Derek. So how did you come to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses in the first place? I was born in. Uh, both of my parents um, were Jehovah's Witnesses, and I think it goes back about three three generations, um, roughly, at least two, uh, but possibly three generations. Yeah, that's it's quite a few for a young religion, really, when you think about it. Um, so, do you have any idea, you know, what the origination was of it in your family? Um, you know, that's who, a little who it was yeah, that, or how it came about. Yeah, that's a little it's a little cloudy um, just because I don't really know too much about my great grandparents. Yeah. But I have uh, kind of an inkling that they were kind of um, they had studied uh, a little bit with uh, with Jehovah's Witnesses at some point or they were related somehow. But really, I think the big kind of push came with my my grandparents um, on my dad's side. Um, they I think I want to say that they, they celebrated Christmas there for a little while. Um, but they, uh, yeah, so they started studying. So I'm not a hundred percent sure. I know how my mom, uh, became a witness kind of more uh, than my grandparents. Mm-hmm. Uh, but my dad was more or less was raised by, by Jehovah's witness parents. Um, my grandfather wasn't really, really strong. Um, my grandmother was, <clears throat> was the, the one that was, um, definitely the matriarch in the family. And she, you know, she made sure that, that, um, her five children went to the meetings and that they, you know, de- did what they needed to do. Um, I think my, out of those five children, my, uh, one of my uncles and my dad were probably the strongest. Um, the uh, other siblings weren't as strong, yeah. um, in, in, in the truth, but, um, quote unquote truth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, my, um, 
so my grandparents uh, studying my, my grandfather wasn't always super strong. Um, and then on my mom's side, um, my mom's parents were never were never witnesses. Um, my mom was born in uh, Puerto Rico and she came to the States when she was eight um, and she was kind of given away by her mother. Um, she was one of 13 children. Oh, wow. um, yeah. So a lot of kids, she had nine brothers and uh, three sisters and she was number 13. Um, but she came to, uh, she came to the States and she lived with her aunt and uncle and her, um, her aunt and uncle, um, started, I think when my mom was probably in her, I want to say maybe early teens, I think they started studying with Jehovah's Witnesses and somebody just came to their door. It was kind of the same, same scenario, came to the door. They started, um, you know, studying the, the, the Bible. I'm not sure what publication at the time. Um, and then my mom, you know, became, became a witness. Um, I want to say that she was baptized in, I think, 1970, I think, um, I believe. And then she, sh- shortly after that, she married, um, she came to a meeting actually to meet my dad's best friend. Um, and my dad's best friend was, uh, getting ready to go to Bethel. So he wasn't really interested. Um, and so my dad was like, Hey, you know, if you're not interested in, in her, um, you know, is it okay if I you know, pursue her? So, um, my mom and dad dated for, I think a month or two, and then they were married, um, like really, really quickly. And then shortly after that, um, my parents ended up moving to out West, uh, to serve where the need was great. And so moved to Colorado and then Montana and then back to Colorado. Um, and so that's where myself and my, I have a sister, I'm the youngest of three. Um, I have a brother, a sister than me. Um, and we were all born out West. Um, and so they, yeah, like I said, they moved out West, out West. Um, and we, or they went to were my dad was one of elder, one of, uh, like one or two elders in the majority of those congregations, um, oh, so really? he, you know, wore a lot of different hats. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, yourself being raised in it, never knowing anything different, what was the worldview that it gave you? How'd you see the people around you or, um, you know, sometimes maybe even yourself, you know, as separate sure. from them. Sure. So like our home environment, um, since my dad was so involved, um, in the congregation, uh, and he worked a full-time job too. Um, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't present very often. So it was, it was, uh, very clear early on in my life that, that, um, my dad was just kind of removed from our family for the most part. He was definitely a provider. He provided for us and, you know, we had the things that we needed. Um, but as far as on like an emotional level, um, uh, he, he was definitely just absent. Um, and when he was there, he was very much of a, a as a, an authoritarian. Um, so my worldview uh, early on was, you know, everything was structured. Everything revolved around the meetings and field service, um, making sure that you don't bring reproach on Jehovah's name, making sure you don't bring reproach on our family's name. Um, so everything revolved around um, you know, field service and the meetings. Um, when we weren't at school, Um, we were out in service. And so, uh, also my worldview was, was very fearful. It was, you know, constantly fearful that I was going to bring reproach on Jehovah's name. I was going to bring reproach on my family's name. And ultimately I was going to die at Armageddon if I made a mistake. So, um, no pressure. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I mean, no no pressure. Just don't make a mistake because, uh, you're going to die if you do. Yeah, um, and that's and that's really tough on a child. Yeah, yeah, uh, it is. for a child to be like, "Hey, I went to school and um, I made this, you know, Halloween-related thing," or um, I went to uh, there, I was playing with with another kid in the congregation, and they have a, you know, a, a, like a, a toy gun. I can't play with that gun because it's, you know, it's or or the Smurfs. It was always something about the Smurfs, like the Smurfs were demonized. Um, and so you can't play with Smurfs or anything that's demonized. And then, you know, so it's just it's just this constant fear based. Um, and and so that was tough. But yeah, and um, I like that, you know, we're talking about worldview and you're not necessarily talking about your view of the outside world. 
because yeah. your world was on the inside. You know, that that's what you had. Um, it was meetings, service, um, fear, you know, that, that dominates everything and kind of is your world and creates that worldview uh, for you. Right. And I really think that 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 view too was how you know other people perceive our family since my dad was an elder it was always like yeah don't bring approach on jehovah's name but more importantly don't bring up approach on our family name because you know i'm an elder and i have a responsibility um for for this family and if i'm not doing what i'm supposed to be doing then i can't be an elder so yeah. um you know and people in the congregation perceived my father a lot differently they perceived him as a very loving um you know, and kind and understanding, compassionate a person. But on the other side, he was very hard nosed. Um, <clears throat> and we, you know, we were definitely um, <laughs> disciplined by, you know, a belt and by, you know, the quote unquote rod and then also by, you know, the publications in the Bible. So, you know, if we went to a meeting and we, you know, I always like to doodle, I always like to like, <laughs> you know, not pay attention. Um, so, <laughs> Uh, whenever there was a chance, we were always either taken, taken to the bathroom, um, and, uh, and disciplined, or, you know, we were told that we were going to be dealt with when we got home. And usually what that meant was, uh, a belt or, uh, a spanking or, and then after that, it was, let me tell you why, you, why you did, you know, why, what you did was wrong. Ugh. And let me show you in the, in the Bible, you know, how I'm the head of this household and you're going to listen to me. And man, sometimes that's, us. that's worse than the whipping. Oh man. I would rather, I would rather have the, the, you know, the, the whipping than, than, you know, beat me with, beat me with the belt. I'd rather take yeah. that than beat me with the Bible. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And just, and, and because that's also just beating you mentally and emotionally. It's uh, just yeah, man. shame and stuff. So, and, and I have to ask you because you brought it up, um, Mm -hmm. how the people in the congregation saw your dad versus how you saw your dad. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, I know <clears throat> how it was for me. My dad uh, was very emotionally abusive and, you know, then he's up there on Sundays giving talks about happy family life and just totally yeah. making stuff up. That's not true about our family. And that's not how we worked and saying it from mm -hmm. the platform. Um, to the point where my mom would even leave the auditorium for a lot of his talks. Yeah. Um, but what I if, remember, I remember you saying that in your, in uh, this JW life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so how did it, you know, and it, and it felt terrible, you know, it just, it was yeah. just like such a farce. How did it feel for you knowing that people saw him like put him up on a pedestal and saw him a certain way. And that's not necessarily the truth of who he was. Uh, behind closed doors. How did that feel for you? Yeah. So, um, I definitely always had this like sick feeling in my stomach and almost like this, um, you know, they, they talk about like spitting something lukewarm out of your mouth. Um, yeah. I always used to use that, that, that verse, but that's how really how I felt. I felt disgusted because I knew what type of, of person, um, my father, my father really was, uh, behind closed doors. And, uh, it was like we were living a, a facade. It's like we had to, you know, we would go home and he would, especially when he would get mad at us about something, um, he would choose not to speak to us. Uh, and there were times where, um, you know, he was a provider. He provided for us. Um, and I can appreciate that about that man. But I, I definitely don't respect him in the sense that he really liked to um, use you know, mental and emotional abuse, um, more than, than physical abuse. And, and sometimes, and he would, especially at a young age, I remember him getting upset at my mom for something and us, um, he would take it out on us. And so he would take a, a cardboard box and put it in the middle of our living room where we all had to walk past every day and he would put his stuff in it. Um, and he would basically feel would threaten that he was going to leave. And, um, and I remember getting to the point where I was like, I hope you do leave and you don't come back. <laughs> I was like, because we'll be better off uh, yeah. without you. And my mom always, you know, whenever my dad would be getting home from work, um, she would always like, you know, a half an hour before he got home, you know, hey, make sure you guys straighten up uh, before your dad gets home. So it was like we were constantly having to walk around on eggshells. So, um, you know, seeing that and seeing how he treated um, my mom and how he treated us, you know, giving us the cold shoulder and, um and then we would go to the meetings and like you said, he would, you know, he would have a, 
a, a talk about, you know, the family arrangement and, uh, and being respectful and, you know, and yeah. all of those, you know, those, those things. And then I would just be sitting in the audience and just being like, this guy is just a, a fucking liar. <laughs> yeah. And can we say a, that being a provider is, is like fine. It's a good thing to do, but mm -hmm. it's also like, the most basic thing you have to do as a parent. And if you don't, then your kids get taken from you. So let's, right. you know, let's not give you a gold star just because you provided some material things or food for your family. Right. Like, there's more to being a dad than that, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and I know like, you know, looking back on it, you're exactly right. Like I say that because he always did provide for us. And there were times where he was really, really kind, but yeah, okay. it was, you know, looking back on it, just the emotional abuse and, you know, the physical abuse that we went through sometimes. Um, it, it's just looking back on it. I'm just like, man, yeah, you were a provider, but you're a terrible human. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> honestly, I don't want to be anything like you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That cardboard box thing. Uh, oh, yeah, dude. that's his abuse. That's very abusive. That's I mean, and would, petty and immature, really. And he would punch holes in walls and he would break things. And I mean, I remember we, we had gotten a Nintendo and you know how kids are. It was like when it first came out and we were down in the basement and, you know, a we weren't allowed to be inside a lot. Like if he was home. He wanted us outside playing and he didn't want us inside. So we were all like my brother and sister were playing Nintendo and <laughs> and they um, they were arguing or whatever. And so my dad had an office in the basement where they were at. So he just comes out of the office and he just tears it out of the wall and just takes the TV out to the it takes the TV out to the the yard and literally with a baseball bat beats this TV until it's practically broken and then puts the TV in the the garage. It still worked. Um, so he, he, he beats the crap out of this TV, which he paid for, and also the Nintendo, which he breaks, and then puts it out in the garage for like a month or so, and then brings it back when we're ready. And it's got like these screws in it where he's like screwed the casing of the TV back together. And I'm like, dude, you just... <laughs> that is a guy who yeah. is not living a life that he wants to live. That is a and guy the, who is very frustrated. Yeah. Yeah. So, and there were times where, you know, I remember I made a mistake one time and I, I stole something from, from, uh, from, uh, I stole a single from, I still remember from NRM, it's national <laughs> record mart or whatever. Yeah. It was the gangster's paradise. Coolio. Single. Yes. I still remember. <laughs> I stole it because I know, A, we weren't allowed to have rap and I didn't have any money and I thought it was okay to take, but it obviously wasn't. So my, they found it. Long story short, my dad broke it in half, took me back to the store. I had to tell the manager what I did, uh, pay for it. Um, and then before that, he like punched a hole in my wall and was like, you know, so I mean, like, I understand your kid made a mistake, you know, kids do that. Yeah but you don't need to punch a hole through a wall. And I think the lesson he taught me taking it back to the store, I think that was a good lesson, Sure. but um, you know, punching a hole in the wall. And what's funny is he covered that hole with one of the, um, one of the, the yearly calendars that had, uh, <laughs> that had all the scriptures on it. So literally <laughs> there's a hole behind my wall uh, through the drywall and it was covered with one of the, the calendars oh, that I had to record God. my service time on for the longest time. And then he finally fixed it. And I'm like, dude, you're a child. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that, that that is a guy who's acting out. That is a guy who is no. uh, just not not a very happy guy. Um, right. And I don't know. You know, I don't. Unfortunately, I don't really know what my my dad's childhood looked like yeah. because he didn't talk about himself a lot. He didn't talk about the way he was raised. He, I, so I, I honestly only know actually both of my parents really as just Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't know them as people, um, yeah. which is which is unfortunate. But, um, you know, as far as the way he was he, he was raised, um, I know that his he had a lot of uh, tension with his father <clears throat> Um and so I don't know if he was mentally abused or, you know, physically and mentally abused yeah. um, as a child. Uh, but I, I, didn't, I don't know. I know at one point he was um, prescribed medication for, for depression. Um, so I don't know. I would really go out on a line. I mean, I'm no like psychologist or anything like that, but I would really go out on a line and say that my dad was probably bipolar or something because he was all over the place, man. You never knew what, what was going to happen with him. Um, yeah, he probably had a lot of pain in his, yeah. in his life. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
uh, yeah, that's that's a very frustrating place to be. Um, right. You know, uh, as a kid, you know, with a volatile father. Uh, yeah. That's and. and as let's you know, as a wife, um, you know your mom with a volatile yeah. husband. Uh, yeah, that's just not a a healthy place for anybody. She's uh, definitely a patient woman. I'll have to give her that. <laughs> very <laughs> very patient, and I think that um, kind of with her, <clears throat> you know, since she didn't really have a family, uh, you know, growing up, like she was always estranged from, from her family. Her mom gave her away. I have this huge side of my mom's family that I don't even know. I know, <clears throat> pardon me. I know one of her sisters Yeah. Uh, that lives in New York. And other than that, like, I don't know any of, I didn't know my grandparents. Um, I'm pretty sure my, from what I've gathered, my grandfather committed suicides shortly after my mom came to the States. Um, is kind of the feeling that I got. And then my grandmother, I never knew. She passed away um, a f- probably like 10 years ago or more. Um, and like nobody in the family let my mom know uh, that her mom had passed away until like a year after the fact. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of, it kind of gives you kind of some, some perspective as to like the family. And I don't, it's not like my mom did anything. Like she was given away from, I remember her telling a story about, how she overheard her mom and her dad talking about how they had too many children and they needed to get rid of one of them. And oh my, my mom, gosh. I guess my, my mom was the smallest. Um, and so um, I, my mom kind of painted a picture that my grandfather was actually going to kill my mother. So that's kind of the environment that my mom grew up in. Good and so, sh- yeah. So shortly after that, um, my mom was put on a plane, didn't understand what was happening, was put on a plane, went to go see her aunt aunt in San Juan um, and was put on a plane and was sent to the United States, uh, flew into you know New York City and did, had no idea what was happening. Was on a plane by herself, um, more or less, and uh, went to New York and started this new life with a family that she didn't even know. So, um, so despite all of that, my mom was always a very... Um, warm like she was very warm personality like everybody in the congregation loved my mom um all my friends growing up would love to come over to our house because they would always be get fed because my mom would always be like the first thing (laughs) that would happen when you walk through the door was like are you are are you hungry can i feed you uh i definitely think that's a cultural thing um but that's just kind of the atmosphere. Like everybody wanted to come and hang out at, at, uh, at our house. Cause we always had like leftovers and food in the fridge and stuff. So, um, but she was, a she was a pioneer. <clears throat> she was always a regular pioneering. And, um, so some of my first memories growing up were, uh, out in service with my mom and, uh, going from door to door and, And she was always, she was always out in service. She didn't work. Um, so she, you know, kept the home and, and, um, she was always out in service and put in those hours and very, very warm personality. Um, and she was always had lots of Bible studies and, um, so yeah, so she did a lot of that. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned having a lot of friends over, so, were these people I assume from the kingdom hall? Yeah. Yeah. So did you have a lot of friends at the hall? Yeah. So when we moved, we moved from, um, we moved from Colorado. Uh, I do want to backtrack a little bit after this, but, um, we moved from Colorado to, uh, to, um, Southeast Ohio area. Um, and there, there were three different congregations. So there was a lot more, um, kids our age in the congregation. When we grew up out West, there was like nobody in these congregations. So there was only a few children. So, um, so yeah, that was kind of the, you know, the contrast between living out West and these congregations where, you know, there was a need opposed to moving, you know, East and living in an area where there's three different congregations with, with, um, you know, uh, uh, a congregation of like a hundred or more publishers, so there were a lot of kids in that area. So, gotcha. but in Colorado, there were a few, um, there were a few, uh, kids in the hall that were our age. Um, I, I know I spent a lot of time by myself just because I don't think there were a lot. Um, 
there were a lot of uh, younger girls that were in the congregation. They were about my age group. Um, and there were a few uh, younger ones that were around my brother and sister's age. So my brother is seven years older than I am. So, and then my sister is uh, like four years older than I am. So there were more kids in that congregation their age than there were my age. So, um, but yeah, it was a cool place to grow up where there was a lot of stuff to do outside, lots of like rivers. Um, there was like a river about a mile behind our house that we, my brother and I used to go to and swim and fish and jump off bridges and stuff like that. Um, and we had a, had a really, really good time growing up in that small, even though it was a small town, um, there was a lot of, of stuff to do outside. So we were always doing that, which was nice. Yeah. That's awesome. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, while we were out there in Colorado, um, like I said, I kind of painted a picture of, of our, my world. Um, also that world was, <laughs> was even more fearful because there was lots, not only was there physical abuse and mental abuse by my father, um, but there was not by my father, but there was, uh, there was also, uh, sexual abuse from, from somebody in, in, in my family. Um, and so one of the, my first memories, um, is being sexually abused by, by my sister. Um, and so that kind of paints a totally different kind of perspective of, um, you know, nobody wants their first experience, uh, especially to be that, that young, that's one of my earliest memories. So I was anywhere from probably four or five, it's kind of fuzzy, but four or five years old. Um, nobody wants their first, their first experience to be with, um, that young and also with, you know, with a family member. So, um, so yeah, so it was a really muddled, muddled, uh, you know, way to grow up was, you know, you're in this, you're in this high control group. Um, you have an authoritarian father, uh, you have a mother that's very submissive and, and doesn't want to push back on her, on her, um, on her husband, because this is the only family that she has. This is the only family that she knows. And then you have, um, three kids that are thrown into that mix that are just trying to figure out what makes sense. Um, and, and so it's yeah, tough. And, yeah. and, and it's not, so, I mean, if you were four or five or whatever, and your sister mm-hmm. was, four years older than you, um, mm-hmm. then, you know, you, then that begs the question you know, a lot of times, where did she learn? Absolutely. That, you know, yeah. Not usually yeah. in a vacuum. Yeah. And that's, that's one thing that I've tried, I've tried to, I was been thinking about lately is like, you know, obviously I'm never, I'm never going to know, <laughs> but like, like where did she learn that? Like who exposed her to that? Because like you said, kids don't do that on their own normally. Um, so that's, that's definitely a learned behavior. So yeah. Um, and I can forgive that because she was so young. Um, but, and it wasn't just insulated to her. There was also, um, for a long time, I had a really hard time trusting women because, um, my sister took us to, <laughs> these, uh, these people are in a congregation. Um, they had two daughters and we were sent there to be, it was the same, you know, kind of cliche scenario of babysitters. And mm. so we went to that, we went to this, you know, these people's house and they had two daughters and they were a little bit older than my sister. Uh, they, they knew better. Um, but it was like, my sister took me kind of like a show and tell thing, like, Oh, like, look, look what I can do with him. And so I was passed on. Um, there's probably about five different, uh, girls, Jehovah's witness girls that, um, you know, it was kind of like a circuit. (laughs) So, um, so yeah. So I think, I think that's important to point out because, um, a lot of times abuse is typically pointed at, uh, men or boys um, yeah. as being the aggressors in a situation. And um, unfortunately, you know, uh, you know all uh, both men, male and female uh, can be perpetrators of these things. And, right. um, and it's, it's, um, you know, just a situation. It, it's a sad situation. And if, if all these girls are doing this, it's a, it's a very, um, there there's something there you know uh yeah. bigger than just probably those girls unfortunately right yeah i mean that's it's really really sad um 
in in the sense that you know this happens more often than than not yep. um in, in in these type of insular groups where um you know sexuality is um is demonized and is you know you're taught that even you know masturbation is dirty you're not supposed yep. to do that and so you know when you have a a group or organization that really um you know paints sexuality in such a a dark negative and demonic way uh then people are are, are going to feel it a shame for doing it and they're also not going to talk about it yep. it would have been a lot probably a lot easier for me later down the road had i went come forward and and said hey this is happening but since it ha- happened with somebody in my family and then also other people in the congregation, um, I was always afraid to come forward because I thought that, you know, it was an A, going to tear apart my family, um, and then B, it was going to tear apart the congregation. And then on top of that, like, you get so conditioned when when you are an abu- are sexually abused you, you, you know, for a while you feel like you're, you're such a victim. Um, and then on top of that, it's like, that's the only attention, you know, that's the only thing that you've ever known. So you almost see it as normal. So then you go looking for that type of, that type of attention. And, and so as a child in a little, you know, in a little person's brain, that's normal to them. And that's how they express affection. And that's how, so on top of that, growing up in this, you know, this, this high control group, you, in this cult, you, you say, okay, well this thing happened, but also this thing feels good sometimes. What, what do I do with that? Now now I'm, you know, I'm damned on so so many different levels. Jehovah, Jehovah hates me. He's going to destroy me at Armageddon. Um, you know, I'm going to tear apart my family. You have all these things that, that a kid at that age shouldn't even be thinking about. Yep. They shouldn't, they shouldn't have to have these stresses of worrying about these different things. All they should, should know is, Hey, this doesn't feel safe. Um, this happened. I need to tell an adult so that this ad- the adult can, can, can make it better. Or, you know, in the group that we, we, we grew up in, in as a, you know, a witness, well, you know, if I take this problem to Jehovah, you know, everything is going to be okay. And so for me, you know, praying and pouring my heart out to, to Jehovah and saying like, Hey, I really want this to stop. I want these feelings to stop. I don't want to do this stuff anymore. Like, I don't want to be a part of this. Please make it go away. And for that God, not to answer the, those prayers early on in my life, I, I was like, well, I don't believe in that God. I don't believe in that God. And I can't believe in that God because he wasn't there for me. Um, and so, you know, that's a whole other thing. So not, not only are you not safe in your family arrangement, you're not safe in, 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 um, in an organization because, you know, everything you do that's related to immorality, you need to go to the elders and tell the elders and, and, and in order to be absolved. But then on top of that, you go to God and you pour your heart out to God. So, I mean, like you're kind of screwed on so many different levels yeah. that you feel like there's nobody out there to help you and nobody there for you. Yeah. And uh, the definition of being alone. (laughs) It's so sad. Yeah. And as a kid too, you know? Yeah. Um, Yeah. That you're being taken advantage of and not helped um, everywhere that you turn, turn for help. Um, So how do you, do you end up getting baptized at some point? Um, And, you know, because you're talking about, struggling with believing in that God as these things were going mm-hmm. on. Um, did you still believe enough to get baptized or did you get pressured into it? Or how did things kind of progress as you went into your teenage years? Uh, as far as my teenage years go, I was baptized. Um, I was baptized at 11 um, so I was really young, yeah. uh, definitely too young to make that type of decision. And, um, it was, I mean, this is all I knew. So, um, I knew that I was definitely pressured on, on certain, cause it's like you get to a certain age when you're in the congregation that if you're not getting baptized or you're not, you know, taking on responsibilities, especially as a male, um, 
you know, taking on responsibilities, then you're looked at as you're spiritually weak. Right. Yep. So, um, so I was 11 and I knew that there were other, uh, some of my friends in the congregation were getting baptized and I was like, well, you know, and I also felt a little pressure from my dad. Um, and you know, not only my dad, but just my mom too. Um, to get baptized. So, and people in the congregation like, Oh, well, when are you going to get baptized? When are you going to get baptized? And so I went ahead and did it. And I remember going through the questions and I remember, you know, answering, you know, verbatim what they wanted to hear. Um, but at that time it's like, you're making, you're making a verbal contract with somebody and most contracts you go to, you know, legal binding contracts, you can't make until you're 18 years old. <laughs> so uh, you know, you're 11 years old making a verbal contract, not with God, you know, but you're, you're making it with an organization and so, you know, and if something happens, you know, you're screwed. Uh, yeah, this so, is a forever contract with no yeah, way out. <laughs> yeah, this is like sign in no blood. No good way out anyway. You, you know, you sell your soul or something. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I remember being like kind of excited to do it because, and it wasn't necessarily for um, to be a Jehovah's Witness. It was because you're taught that when you are baptized and if your heart is in the right place, that you are, um, you know, that essentially that your sins are washed away. So for, for, for me, it felt like if, if I were, were baptized, um, that everything that I did in the past, you know, all of the abuse, all the wrong things that had happened, um, the sexual abuse, all of that stuff, all that stuff would go away. I'd start with a, a clean slate. Yeah. Um, and so for me, that was my way of, of washing, you know, washing all that stuff away by getting baptized. Did you and feel little, guilty about the abuse? Oh yeah. yeah. I felt like, especially like I touched on earlier is I felt so much shame in it because yeah. not only was it with a family member, but also, um, you know, it felt good, you know, I sure. mean, your body's going to naturally respond to these things. Yep. Um, you know, even if you're in a distressed situation, your body is going to respond and, uh, you can ask any type of psychologist, you can ask any type of doc doctor yep. that's, you know, that's versed in, in trauma, abuse, neglect, um, all of that stuff, your body is going to have a natural reaction to these type of things. So yes, I felt shame, a deep level of shame, a deep uh, level of guilt. I felt dirty. I felt, you know, all of the terrible things that, that you could associate with, with, um, you know, being abused. Yeah. And, um, and that's one thing I felt manipulated. Uh, I felt manipulated by my sister. I felt, um, just all around, just like a, a, a dirty person. And so I felt like getting baptized would, would wash all those things away. It would make me feel like, um, a, a new person. And so when I did that, um, I didn't feel any different. Um, I was baptized and then first, I would say for a brief amount of time, I felt like, um, like, yeah, okay. My, my sleep, my slate's wiped clean. And then, the the abuse happened again shortly after that so it was like everything was for naught so oh, wow another ho another hopeless situation <laughs> so yeah absolutely you know here you are yeah. you think well i just did this thing and and I, i'm gonna get past this yeah. this is gonna make it all okay and yeah that's that's got to be devastating um mm -hmm. So where do you go from there? Uh, you know, you're baptized. Um, did you, I mean, you were only 11, so you can't r reach out in the congregation for too much at 11. Um, yeah. But, you know, did you, how'd you go on about your life as a witness or, um, you know, did the, did the abuse continue? How, how, just how do you go through this teenage life now? because it seems like things uh, didn't quite get better just because you got baptized. Right. So about 12 years old is when I, 12 to 13, I think is when the abuse stopped. I, I'm pretty sure. Um, like I said, my, my one thing about when you're in, you know, uh, a traumatic situation is sometimes things you, you know, you compartmentalize things and you, you start, um, you know, some, some dates and things start to become really fuzzy. So sure. shortly, so shortly after that, um, I was baptized, the abuse did stop. Um, I don't remember what happened. I don't know how it stopped. It just, it just stopped, I guess. Um, so, um, but one of the reasons why I want to get baptized too, is because I wanted to like handle the microphones. So, um, like every other yep. little witness boy. Um, <laughs> so, 
started running the microphones because it would give me something to do during the meetings. I think looking back on it also, it was kind of, you know, a prestigious thing to do like, Oh, you, you know, you can do this. So, um, started handling the microphones started, um, eventually when I was a little bit older, started running the, the, the sound, which I really, really enjoyed that part of it because not only was I not like in the actual, you know, the sitting up front in the seat with, um, with my family, it got me away from them. I didn't have to sit with them. I didn't have to sit with my dad and constantly have to worry about like, am I doodling too much or am I not paying attention? Yeah. So I'm back in the back running the sound. Um, and while I'm back there, I'm not paying attention to anything that's being said. Um, I'm, <laughs> I always like to, I know I keep on saying it, but like, I always like to doodle and I always like to like, I would write, I would like write poetry or, or I would write, you know, little things here and there. Um, while the meeting was going on, you know, making sure that the microphones are still adjusted so people can give their answers. But um, yeah, you got to at least the... pay attention to that because <laughs> that, that, that's, yeah. that's a I dead was, giveaway. If, yeah, if somebody's I was, mic's I was not on. good at doing that. Um, <laughs> and then I, you know, I also gave talks. I gave number twos and number fours. Um, and, uh, that, and that's one thing that I, I actually did, even though, um, you know, I, I always felt like there was butterflies in my stomach, that like positive, you know, anxiousness yeah. um, about giving a presentation. But I did like doing the public speaking. I liked um, writing up a talk and giving examples and, you know, and tying everything into whatever the scripture was. So the study material. But that's really the only thing that I really enjoy doing. I didn't enjoy studying for the meetings. I didn't enjoy preparing. I didn't read any of the publications unless I absolutely had to. So from the early age, I mean, I struggled with attention issues. So for me sitting down and reading something, especially something that I wasn't interested in, um, really was like watching the grass grow. Like I just couldn't, (laughs) I I just couldn't do it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. So, um, you know, I was always the kid in school, um, that got the report card that said, Hey, Derek has a hard time staying on task. He has a hard time staying in a seat. He has a hard time not speaking when he shouldn't, <laughs> you know, all of the, and my teachers liked me. I wasn't like a problem child, but they were just like always set on my report cards would say like, you know, he's not meeting his potential. We know he can do more. Yep. So it was the same thing with the meetings. Like I would, I would prepare some comments and stuff. When I got a little bit older, I would actually take a little bit more notice and prepare some comments and stuff. And I definitely felt like those comments sometimes were genuine. I mean, not everything in the Bible is terrible and not everything in those publications is horrible. However, um, you know, there, there was some useful stuff in that I gathered from, so it wasn't all negative. Um, I really did enjoy the theocratic ministry school. And I think that it really helped me later in life when giving presentations and, you know, understanding public speaking and also the field service, getting out there and being able to talk to complete strangers. Um, I mean, there for a while I did sales and that's really key, like being able to find a common ground with people. And I would have to say a lot of that can be, um, you know, drawn back to going out in field service and being part of the theocratic ministry school. So, you know, there weren't all terrible things that came out of being a witness. Um, yeah, I'm totally but... going to grade you after this, just so you know. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I haven't heard that five minute bell yet. <laughs> but, but yeah, man, I mean, when I was out in service, I, I liked getting out, especially if I didn't have to go with, with like my dad or, or anybody, like I would go out with some yeah. of the older ones in the congregation. I always was drawn to them. Um, the older ones, they had some really, really great stories. They took interest in you. Um, they, so there were a lot of really loving people within the organization that really made me feel welcome and that I got really close to. Um, I didn't like going out and knocking on doors and running into somebody that you, you know, went to school with. So <laughs> there was, uh, <laughs> right? uh, I know I was, uh, you know, talking to you a little bit earlier about Matthew's episode. I've listened to pop, uh, parts of it, but like he was talking about how he would go to the door and just stand there for like 15 minutes and very much the same situation. Like if I was able to go to the door by myself, I would look for a doorbell and pr- pretend to press the doorbell and just stand there hoping nobody (laughs) nobody came to the door but i mean all in all i mean there are some really really good memories about going out in service and going to conventions and assemblies and you know hanging out and swimming in the pool at the hotel when you're at a convention and stuff so i mean there are some really really good memories um that i have uh from from being a witness um and 
you know, going out to eat after the Sunday meeting, you know, go get me- Mexican food or going to Applebee's. <laughs> Always for Mexican ha- food. <laughs> <laughs> or going to Applebee's, like, yeah. for their half price appetizers after the meeting and stuff. And uh, especially when I was, like, a little bit older and was able to drive and stuff. So, um and that's one thing too, is like my brother always, he was seven years older than me, but he always took an interest in me. He always, um, wasn't ashamed to take me with him, um, to hang out with his friends and stuff. So I always had a really, really good bond with my brother. He was, um, he was my best friend. And, um, and so it was really hard on me right around, uh, I think 11 or 12 years old, right after I did get baptized. Cause my brother went to Bethel and, um, he went to, to walk Hill and he was gone for, I, th- I want to say three or four years. Um, and he went and he, you know, went up there and, and he was, um, he cleaned, <laughs> cleaned bathrooms yep. and, uh, you know, rooms and stuff like that. And then he became a night watchman. Um, and, uh, he had some really, really positive things, um, that he learned and he grew, you know, at, when he was at Bethel, but then he also came, came home with a lot of, you know, negative stories and, um, he came home with a drinking problem as well. Uh, So there's a um, lot of drinking at Bethel. Right. And I think that that drinking really has carried on, um, into his, in his later life. But he was also, my brother has a lot of, um, emotional, uh, issues, especially when it comes to our father, because out of all of us, you know, we all had it rough. My sister, not so much because she was always my dad's favorite, but my brother and I really got a lot of the brunt. Um, we both had have attention issues and it was really hard to kind of rein us in at times. But my brother really took a brunt of, of all the abuse. I remember the my, oldest. My, yeah, my brother and my dad would get into physical altercations. I remember seeing my brother slammed up against walls. Um, I remember, uh, you know, a lot of them like wrestling on the floor and it wasn't like they're wrestling to play. I mean, it was just a constant like tension between my dad and my brother. And that really, um, I think played on, uh, my brother later in life. Um, and it really, uh, affected him, uh, to the point where I think that he may be self-medicated with some, with alcohol and sure. stuff. So, uh, which is unfortunate, but, um. But yeah, so um, I kind of lost track of where we were going. <laughs> so, so where were you now? You know, a, a lot, you said this was like around the time of your baptism that yeah, your brother yeah. went uh, to Bethel. So what happens to you, you know, over the next years as, as you uh, grow in your teenage yeah. years? Well, you know, I felt since I was, um, you know, the other boy in the house that I needed to take up for my sister, uh, even though, you know, that uh, tumultuous relationship, um, turbulent relationship. Um, so there were times where I definitely took the brunt of my dad's anger. Um, there were times where I was trying to like either stand up for my mom or stand up for my sister. And I remember specifically one time and, um, is like my dad had, uh, been yelling at my sister for some reason. And she was up, she, her room was upstairs and my room was at the bottom of the stairs. And so, um, you know, they had argued and stuff and I just went up to check on my sister cause she was crying and, um, doing the brotherly thing, you know? And so my dad starts yelling at me, like, you know, leave her alone or whatever. So I come back down to the bottom of the stairs. And at that time, I think I'm like, I want to say I'm like 13 or so, um, 12 or 13. And I remember like just getting really frustrated and like just kind of letting my dad have it. I don't remember exactly what I said, but I remember I was getting ready to, to turn into my, like go into my room and I was going to shut my door and basically slam my door in, in, in my dad's face. And I remember turning around and right when I turned around, I saw my dad's fist raise. Like, I don't know if he was going to hit the door. I don't know if he was going to hit me, but it really felt like he was going to hit me. And so I looked at him and I said, go ahead. I remember this specifically. I said, go ahead. I was like, go ahead and hit me. I was like, go ahead and ruin your your relationship with me. Like you've ruined your relationship with my brother. Um, and I remember instantly seeing him and he like melted, (laughs) which was like my first sense of like empowerment. But then I also felt bad for him. Um, for a minute there, I was like, you know, forget you, you know, you're not going to do this to me. I'm my own man. Uh, but then on top of that, I saw this, you know, this gray haired man, um, that 
just melt. And, um, just a sad and so little I, man. yeah. And so after that, I was, I always had a really hard relationship, a difficult relationship with my dad. I didn't necessarily get a, later in life. I didn't get like the physical abuse or anything like that, but, um, I definitely got the cold shoulder a lot because he would, he always felt like I was disrespectful, uh, because I would always go against whatever he was saying and I would always question and I would always ask why, or I would always say that, you know, I would stand up for myself. Um, yeah. and, and that was difficult, especially to an authoritarian like him. But, um, so yeah, yeah authoritarians so after... don't like to be questioned in any way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, when my brother went to, to Bethel, I, you know, I took on a lot of that. Um, I was the whipping post, uh, after my brother. So, um, so yeah. And then, you know, I would, I went to school. I didn't do super well in school because I, like I said, I had all of, you know, the, the, the attention issues, but then I had the abuse, um, and uh, all the trauma and stuff to go through. So, um, you know, middle school and early high school were a little difficult. I was well liked. Um, I had a lot of different friends from different, you know, cliques or whatever you want to call mm -hmm. them. Um, I was always the person was like, Hey, if you're cool with me, I'm cool with you. Like, um, but I didn't definitely didn't, uh, advertise that I was a witness. Um, uh, there for a while, like in junior high, there were other witnesses that were in the school that I was really close with. And so they were very vocal about their beliefs and about things that they, they did and things that they didn't do. And so kids knew that there were witnesses. And so through proxy, like, everyone kind of knew that I was a witness to. Yeah. Um, but I definitely didn't advertise it cause it wasn't something that I was proud of. Um, it was, you know, it was hard. It was hard going to school. It was hard. Um, especially when, especially birthdays, man, like birthdays were always the hardest thing for me to, to, um, not celebrate. Really? And I always kind of, I always kind of tried to celebrate them in my own way because I'm like, I don't understand. Like, you know, you, Michael, like if, you hadn't been born, my, my life would be totally different. And so that was like always my perspective. Like right. anybody that, anybody that I knew, I always appreciated their birthday because I'm like, if you weren't born, my life would be, I wouldn't know you, you wouldn't exist. You, you, I wouldn't have learned something from you. I wouldn't have shared a, a laugh with you or, or whatever. So right. like always in my own way, I tried to like appreciate people's birthdays. Um, so that was always difficult for me to, to wrap my head around and the holidays. I mean, we grew up without them. So it was always tough though, coming back to school after Christmas or whatever. Oh, yeah. And, and like, you know, everybody's talking about all the things that they did and, um, and all the, you know, all the stuff that they got. And then they would always be like, Oh, Hey Derek, like, what did you get? And I always painted, like painted the picture. My dad's company would always have like, um, like they got discounts on like lift tickets to go skiing or snowboarding or whatever. Yeah. So I always painted the picture of, and usually we would go Christmas day because the, the lift tickets were really cheap. Um, and so we would go skiing or snowboarding. And so I would always tell the kids at school, I was like, oh, well, we went and we, you know, I would lie and say we stayed at a cabin at so and -so, like, you know, at Canaan or Snowshoe or, you know, or, or wherever. And I would always kind of paint a picture like, oh, well, we had Christmas at this lodge and made it look nice and stuff because I didn't want to say like we don't celebrate Christmas because I didn't want to be different. I already felt like I was so much i was different than everybody else or at least i felt that internally i was different than everyone um that i didn't want to paint a, this a bigger picture of how different i was than everyone else so oh, yeah um what you know, did you get that that question when you said that what yeah. did you get oh i hated that question mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, the I'm same getting, nothing just, I always get. <laughs> I, I know, know, man. And it's like, and, it, and people just don't understand. They look at you and they're like, "Wait, what?" Like yep. that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you didn't get any presents. That doesn't that doesn't make any sense. And then they feel bad for you. And it's like you. you and then I'm like, I don't really want your pity. This is what I know. Yeah, like, <laughs> nobody wants pity. You're not looking for pity. Yeah, yeah. pity I mean, just it makes just it so, worse. Yeah, it's just, it's so difficult to for especially when you, you know, when you're older, it, you know, you can, it, it's not as difficult, but still it's like, you know, they try to strip every piece of individuality you have. And then on top of that, they try to make you so different than everybody else that you just constantly have this like mm -hmm. cloud over you where you feel like, you know, you're different than everybody else. You can't do these things. I mean, like even playing sports, I know you, you know, listening to your story, like you like to play basketball and you like to play sports with me. I liked baseball and I, I always wanted to row crew. We lived like right on the river. So like, I always wanted to row crew. 
Uh, I wanted to be out on the water. I've always loved the water. So, you know, and I wasn't allowed to do any of those things. And I'm just like, why? Because you're going to be around people that are going to, that are going to question what you believe that that are going to, you know, there's no really, there's no good reason why they don't let you. The only reason is is because they want to keep control over you. Yeah. That's a, that's a fascinating statement you made basically that they, they want to strip your individuality away from you, but make you different from everyone else, which therefore kind of makes you an individual. So they want you to be an individual when you're around quote worldly people so that you're, you're different than them as an individual, but yet they want you to never be an individual around them because you have to be one of the collective. Right. Um, Such a weird dynamic. Well, and I mean, it's, it's, it's one Oh one. It's, cult mind control oh, yeah. it's 101 Textbook. i mean you 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 strip away pieces people's individuality you 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 strip away what makes them unique yep. you say hey you alien you alienate them from the rest of the world yep. um by saying that the rest of the world is um you know evil and demonic and and there to take advantage of you and then on top of that you control what they read what they watch, what they listen to, what they wear, how they have sex with their partner, like or their you know their husband, their wife, what they you know how you can act, what you can and can't do, until there's literally just a shell of a human, yep. and there's nothing else left. And all they can do when they have a question is go to the Watchtower uh, library <sighs> and look up the answer to their question because they and can't think anymore. Exactly. Exactly. One of the saddest and- things is, is how many people, you know, want to take a job or do some sort of recreational activity. And it's like, well, have you looked it up in the publications? <laughs> because oh, like, man, that's the yeah. only way you can decide if you can <laughs> do it or not. That is so messed up. It is. It is. It's, it's so, it's so dehumanizing. Um, and it's just, it's, it's just how they establish control. And, and, you know, one thing that always bothered me too, is like when you go to Bethel, um, and you visit and stuff and everybody, everything's clean and everything is this like utopian society. But, you know, a lot of people don't know what goes on behind the scenes, but, um, I mean, they do now, but at the time, like, you know, that they didn't know what was going on. But one thing that always frustrated me too, is like my brother while he was there, like he had music in his car. And so like you would take your, your car to be serviced, like to have the oil changed at the, at, at Bethel or have the, you know, something worked on. And while they were in there, it was like, people were like investigating about you. They would open up your CD cases. They would, if, if your room was getting cleaned or whatever, they would go through your books. They would go through your, you know, your music collection. They would look for things to rat you out about. And it's just like you live in this, it's 101 cult, man. And until somebody is out of that control group, until they have something that shakes their perspective and shakes their world so hard that it makes them question everything around them, then it's it's not until that point where you're outside of that group that you can actually see life and see yourself with new eyes. Um, it's not until that point. And, uh, you know, there are so many good people that are still trapped inside this organization that, um, you know, it, it just, it hurts my heart that these people are, you know, that are suffering and because they never feel like they're good enough. They never feel like they're good enough and they never feel like what they're doing is enough for the organization. Um, that's the most common refrain I hear. Never good enough it's so sad and it's not healthy. Like my question to them is like, how has this, how have Jehovah's witnesses, how is, how is being a part of this organization bettered your life? <laughs> really, really, I how, know. You look at yes. it, how has it bettered your yeah. life? You're estranged from all of your, all of your family you are from, you know, from your children, from your husband, from your wife, from, from, you know, your parents, whatever you're estranged from all these people. You go to now it's what two meetings a week, yeah. Two me two meetings a week. You have to do all this field service. You have to study all these publications. You have to watch JW broadcasting and listen to all this bullshit propaganda. Um, you have to do all of these things. Like, how is your life any better? Yeah. What like, I what I noticed, I remember one day I noticed I was like, you know, the organization just takes and takes and yeah. takes, and it gives nothing back. 
Right. Um, and I don't, ha- and I didn't have any more to give them. <laughs> you know, so you know, what we call, you know what we call that, right? <laughs> What's that? It's a, it's a parasite. Oh yes, <laughs> it's a parasite. It is a Sorry, parasite. I didn't mean, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, you. No, no, I like that. I like that. So, so what was your path then? So, you know, you're a teenager. Um, what is your path as you start getting older to those moments that wake you and shake you? Yeah. Um. So I had like couple different experiences. I mean, I had a couple of teachers, especially when I was, I started getting into high school. Um, I had a couple of teachers that really, um, they didn't really, cause they didn't really know my belief system either, but they would have us like, you know, think, um, critically about different things. And, um, and so like, I would have to say that a couple of teachers took interest in me and said, Hey, like, you know, you, you're doing really, really well. Like, so my junior and senior year, I kind of turned around and started like doing really, really well in school to the point where I graduated with honors and I graduated with a scholarship and stuff. Um, and so, um, so I had these, these teachers that took it, took an interest in me. I also worked for a gentleman, uh, who took, who took, um, uh, some interest in me and, uh, and he really challenged me to, uh, think outside the box. He was the first one that actually him and his wife, um, were the first people that, um, challenged me to think outside of the, you know, insulated group you know, that, that I grew up in. And so he would challenge my belief system. Um, he also would encourage me to do well in school. Uh, he was a doctor, so he, he really, education was really important to him and his wife. Uh, his wife was a teacher and she went to college as well. Um, and so they really encouraged me to start doing well in school and they would like read over my papers. Cause like my writing proficiency at the time, I mean, I got, I got through school, but it wasn't really, really that great. So they would take a look at my papers before I would turn them in and they really took an interest in my education. And so it wasn't until that point that I started really trying. Cause I was like, well, somebody cares. Like I yeah. could do poorly. I could do poorly at school um, and then come home with my report card and my dad would ground me or punish me or take or reprimand me. And, but it was never like, especially when it came to math at a young age, like I always struggled with math. And so I would come home and I would try to like talk to my dad and be like, Hey, I, I need you to help me with this. And my dad's, my dad's not a dumb man. Like he's very smart. Um, especially when it comes to mathematics mm-hmm. and the way things work and operate, he has, has very much, I think if he had gone to school, he would probably be some form of an engineer, mm-hmm. uh, cause that's the way that his mind works. But so, um, he didn't take any interest in my schoolwork. And so, and especially after like I was made to feel stupid or dumb, or he would throw his hands up and be like, you're just not getting this. I, I can't, re-, you know, the things that a parent aren't supposed to really do. You're supposed <laughs> yeah. to say, okay, well, I know you're struggling with this. And if you can't teach me, then let's find somebody who can teach you. Let's like send you to a tutor. Let's do or something. Let's just or call we... you stupid and shut down. Yeah. You know? man, like, like, that does a lot of good. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And so, and like, I couldn't really go to my mom because I mean, my mom only had, she dropped out after ninth grade. Um, and so I'm, and I'm saying my mom is, is, is uh, not intelligent. She's intelligent in so many different ways. Um, but like she just didn't go to school. So some of the things that I was probably doing, maybe she had never done like, and so, um, but so, yeah, so I, you know, I had these teachers and I had, um, uh, this gentleman and his wife that, that really showed an interest in me and really helped me, uh, to, to really start trying. And so they encouraged me to go to college. And so once I was reaching, um, you know, graduation, I, uh, I um, started looking into like going to college. And so I got a scholarship to go to the local community college. And so at that time, my dad, closer to graduation, my dad starts asking me like, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to go to Bethel? Or are you going to follow your brother's you know, footsteps? Or and at that point, my brother had already left Bethel. So, um, and so he was back home. And, um, and so my dad's like, are you going to go to Bethel? And I'm like, no, I don't want to go to Bethel. And he's like, well, are you going to pioneer? And I'm like, no, I I don't want to do that either. And he's like, well, what are you going to do? You got to do something. And I'm like, well, I'm going to go to college. And he's like, wait, wait, what? And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go to college. And he's like, well, how are you going to pay for it? That was like the first thing that came out of his mouth. And I'm like, I already got a scholarship. Like, I don't, I don't need, I don't need your money. (laughs) Um, And so that was kind of a slap in the face to him. So it was, you know, it was a two year degree. So that was quote like right at that time it was becoming a little bit more acceptable for people to go to um like a tech school or go to like get an associate's degree or whatever so i decided to do that 
Um, and so while I'm at school, while I'm taking these college classes, um, I think one of the, one of the fundamental, like kind of, um, like thinking changes that I had, like a polar shift in my thinking happened when I had this, just this writing class and we had, it was basically just a composition course, but we had to write a, like a thesis paper. And, um, and so, uh, so this teacher, she t- had t- taken an interest in me as well. And so out of anything, like, I don't, I was kind of struggling about things to write about. So I decided to write about philosophy. Um, and so I wrote this, this research paper about philosophy. And in the, in the, the meantime, I started, you know, re- actually reading these things and looking into them and looking into these different ways of thinking or the, the way that, you know, um, these philosophers have analyzed the way that our world functions and the way the morality <laughs> operates and <laughs> conscious and, yeah. uh, you're conscious and like, you know, the, you know, all these different things. And I can't remember what I included in the paper. It's been so long, but, um, that really, and I remember taking it to the professor and her looking at it and being like, wow, like, you know, this is, this is a really good paper. And I had, um, the gentleman that I worked for and his wife look over it. And so it was, you know, grammatically correct and all that stuff. Uh, and, and so she was like, yeah, she's like, it really should, you know, it looks like you're searching for something. And so she encouraged me to, to start. And I actually divulged some more information about, um, being a Jehovah's witness and what I was feeling and, and my frustrations and stuff. And she was ultimate. She was like, well, you know, you need to make the, the decision that's whatever right for you, but it sounds like, you kind of have your mind already made up about how you feel. And so, you know, a few years pass um, and I graduate from, from, um, from college and uh, you know, it was a really happy time. I met some really great people that I'm still close with. and I'm still friends with to this day that really challenged me and really opened up my mind when it came to my, my outside worldview. And I'm like, man, these people are good. Like, they're not drug dealers. They're not going to rape me. They're not going to, you know, murder me. They're really here to help me and really challenge me and make me grow as a human. Like these are good people. <laughs> yeah. Imagine that. <laughs> Which I I had always thought before when I was younger, I'm like, man, it really, was really hard for me to wrap around like how Jehovah is going to create all of this, these people and going to give us free will. And then we exercise that free will and then he's going to destroy us for it. It's like <laughs> yeah. counterproductive. Why not just destroy everything from the beginning and then start over again? Yep. <laughs> but that's reverse logic. Well, right? The point is free so, will. If it's not really, you're not really free to exercise it. That's one of my biggest, that was one of my biggest questions. I'm like, it's not really free will then, you know, it's not free will. No, and there's so, scriptures in the Bible where, um, you know, it says that Jehovah hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Well, now, wait a minute. If you hardened his heart so that he would take a certain action, uh, how's that free will? (laughs) Yeah. There's a lot of issues with free will. (laughs) Sounds like that's predestination to me. So... So yeah, so I um so I graduate and I'm really happy and like all my friends that, that I'm in class with are like you know hey you know we want to go out to eat after and, and drinks um after graduation like you know are you gonna come with us and stuff and I was like yeah I would love to but the same weekend is our convention well I didn't tell them that but I was like oh no I can't I won't be able to walk in graduation uh because I'm gonna be out of town so because I had asked my parents previously I'm like hey can we go to a different convention maybe because I really want to um I really want to walk during graduation and they're like no we're gonna go to our graduation just get your diploma in the mail yeah yeah so all uh, about the conventions yeah so we went to the convention and i remember sitting there in the convention and it was just like thinking about all my friends walking during graduation and them going out and celebrating afterwards and i was just like this sucks <laughs> so um so right around that time is really when uh my dad and i started are really like bumping heads um and i remember coming home one day and he and i got into an argument about something he was talking about how i wasn't doing well and I wasn't like, you know, I wasn't preparing for the meetings and I had missed some meetings. And, um, I also at that time I had been working full time too. Um, so, you know, I was working more and so I wasn't going out in field service and I wasn't doing any of these you know things that I was quote unquote supposed to do. So he asked me if I was taking the truth seriously. And, and at that point I'm just like, you know, I kind of just kind of like him hot it off and I was just like, yeah, whatever, you know? And, um, and then he really was like trying to, to push me yeah. in his beginning. He was getting kind of to the point where he was getting like physically frustrated. And 
So, and he dropped, you know, well, if you're not going to live under, you know, my rules, uh, you know, and if you're not going to, you know, go out and service and go to the meetings and answer and be a good little, you know, you know, um, Jehovah's witness, then, you know, you don't need to live here anymore. And so I just looked at him and was like, okay, I'll be out in two weeks. And, um, I gave him my two week notice. <laughs> and, uh, I quit. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I quit you. <laughs> yeah, I won't say it, but, um, and so, yeah, I was, I got an apartment. I had, um, a friend that worked at the, the not the college I graduated for, from, but from, um, a four year university that was in the area. And he was actually in the, uh, the department for, um, international students. Um, his name is uh, Jamie Kendriowski. Um, and he's a really, really good person. And he helped me, um, he helped me find a place to live. Um, uh, at a really uh, reason I was working at a restaurant at the time he he f- he found me an apartment he went with me nice. even though I didn't go to that school um he went with me to the apartment and was like hey man this is this one's really going to be in your price range like was just a really good friend and he didn't expect anything from me imagine um, that and then nice and when you meet people he, who actually just see you and care about he, you yeah and so he uh he worked out this price with the, with the, the landlord, the property management group, um, told them that I was a student of that college so that I could get a, more of a discount and got me my first apartment for $400 a month with everything included. And like, that's, you can't find that yeah. <laughs> anywhere. Yeah. And it was a really nice apartment and it was great. It was like my sense of freedom. And so, so, you know, I move into this apartment and, you know, he has like a housewarming party for me and like, we have a bunch of friends come over and we like, and then we went out that night and stuff. And it was like, you know, there are people that just genuinely care and don't expect anything from you in return. And, and so, you know, I'm living in this apartment and like, I'm reaching out to all these kids that, you know, are all these people that I went to school with high school with that, like invited me to go do things and, um, you know, wanted to spend time with me. Uh, and I couldn't because I always had to make an excuse. And so I started like little by little, like reaching out to those people and starting to hang out with them more. And I was still kind of going to meetings a little bit here and there. But then, I mean, all of a sudden I was just like, I'm done with this. I'm done. I was treated. So the rumor got out to like people in the congregation that, you know, I had been going out and I had been associating with worldly people and all of these different things. So it was just, um, it was just another eye opener. And so I was like, well, I'm done. I don't want to go to the meetings anymore. I don't want any part of that. And I remember having a couple conversations with like with my family. Um, and I just told him, I was like, I don't want to go to the meetings anymore. I don't really believe the same way you do. And I kind of just left it at that for a while. And so I lived on my own for a few years and worked different jobs and, um, you know, had a lot of fun, uh, probably partied a little bit too much. Um, and then, um, you know, I think once my mind started like opening up, I started, I started experiencing a lot of anxiety. Um, I started experiencing a lot of, um, I had panic attacks at a certain point, um, because your mind is absorbing all of these new things that are completely different and contrary (laughs) to, to, to what you, you know, grew up with. And so, you know, had physical shortness of breath. Uh, I thought I was having a heart attack at one point at like 24 years old, like, and, um, you know, all of these terrible things. And I remember my roommate at the time was, he had experienced panic attacks. And I remember like the first time going down and I was like, man, Hey, you got to take me to the hospital. I was like, something's not right. And he was just like, well, how are you feeling? He started asking me questions. And I remember he's him sitting up with me until probably like five or six o'clock in the morning. Um, and just, just talking to me and like, Hey, let's watch TV. Let's get your mind off of whatever's going on. And, um, and he really understood. And and then I kind of started talking to him a little bit about, you know, what was going on. And, um, and so, you know, I experienced all of those things. And so I started like really, um, at that point I started kind of like self-medicating with alcohol and with some drugs, um, at the time. And, um, because not only did it like numb out what I was feeling, um, but also it helped me kind of connect with others too. Um, and so, you know, when you're under the influence of, you know, whatever drug or, you know, alcohol, Mm -hmm. 
it lets your inhibitions down and you're able to talk about things differently. And so I started like sharing um, certain parts about my life with certain people. And a lot of times they just looked at me and were like, whoa, this is really heavy. Like, <laughs> we, just want, we just want a drink or we just want to get high. Like, why are we talking about this? You're messing with their buzz, man. <laughs> yeah. But then there are other people that are like, wow, like, let's talk more about that. Let's yeah. like, and even when, when I was sober too. So like, you know, or we were just sipping a, sipping a beer or something, you know, and, you know, you start interacting with people. And, you know, people who have become like brothers and sisters to me. Um, and I remember reaching out to uh, one of my friends in Colorado that we grew up with that was a witness and uh, her and her family have since like went out. Um, and they've all like um, none of them are disfellowshipped, but they've all like kind of just disassociated, I think. Um, not like officially, but no, it's faded away. And I remember like reaching out to, to, to her and was like, she was actually interested in my brother at one point, And my, my dad didn't let that happen because her dad wasn't really strong in the truth. And even though her and my brother were the same age and really liked each other, um, and we're actually really compatible at the time. Uh, <laughs> but he didn't because let, her he, dad wasn't yeah, strong. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it makes sense, doesn't it? So, oh, yeah. I, which is really random because uh, I'm actually jumping ahead of myself a little bit. But so I was disfellowshipped, um, and right after I was disfellowshipped, she sent me a letter. I don't know how she. Oh, my mom delivered the the letter um, to where I was living, and it was from my friend. Um, she wouldn't mind if I mentioned her name, April. Um, and so I started talking to her, um, after she wrote me this letter, I reached out to her on the phone and I was just like, Hey, I was like, I just been this fellowship. And I was at like this super low point and just started like emptying my heart out to her. Um, and told her about my experience with my sister and about, she always knew about my dad. She knew that he wasn't what he seemed. Um, and so, and she knew that we were all controlled and my mom was controlled by my dad and all of this stuff. So she was kind of a sounding board and she still is. I mean, I'm really still close to her to this day. And I talk to her not as frequently as I'd like, but, um, she understands. So, you know, coming out of that, that control group, um, one of the things that was hard for me, for me was, you know, everybody, you know, um, everybody you grew up with, everybody who knew you from a young age is no longer there. So for me, it almost felt like I didn't exist. Yeah. Your roots are gone. Yeah. Your roots are gone. And, and I, I felt like for a long time I didn't exist. Um, and, uh, and so there was this person that I could reach out to who knew me as a child, who knew li literally li lived right down the street from us in Colorado. And I used to, she had a trampoline and her mom always had a Pepsi in the refrigerator. And so we would always walk down the street to, to their house and jump on their trampoline. And, um, sometimes we'd stay the night over there and, um, and she always had Pepsi in the fridge and I think they always had candy too. So we were always over there and her, her mom and dad were always really, really nice to us. And always like treated us like we were their own um so yeah um pepsi and trampolines what more could you need <laughs> right backflips and uh and lots of sugar in your stomach yeah so um yeah so she was she's continues to be a really good uh foundation for me and That's even cool. though i haven't seen i haven't seen her since i was 11 years old we still talk and it's like we still you know i really hope i can get out there and see her soon but um so yeah, so uh, so yeah, so I, I moved out on my own. I um, I start living my own life. I start having these panic attacks and start like connecting with people who are really helping me and also don't really understand my story and and but I try to. <clears throat> and from there, um, you know, I pick up some bad habits and uh, and so this elder in the congregation comes to me. Um, I worked at the mall at the time. Comes to me and is like. Hey, it's really good to see you. I haven't seen you at the meetings for a while. Like, you know, uh, he's a man that I really, res I really respect. Uh, I still do. Uh, he was always really kind and, and, and a gentle person. And he was always somebody that I could talk to. And I felt like I could be transparent with. Um, and so he shows up and is like, Hey, like, I know I haven't seen you for a while. Um, you know, let's go grab lunch one day. And I'm like, okay. Like, so I meet up from for, for lunch and then you know, we're talking and he's asking me, like genuinely asking me about my beliefs and like how I'm feeling. And I just told him straight up, I'm like, yeah, I have a lot of questions. I have a lot of doubts. I have all, you know, all these things that I'm feeling. Um, and he's like, okay, well, that's all well and good. Um, and it's okay to have those doubts and stuff. Uh, but we need to have a judicial committee with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, but, but, but we really need to uh, stick it to you here. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm like, 
uh, okay, uh, over my chicken sandwich, okay, I'm like, all right. Um, so I agreed, and at that point, I was like, man, I was at a low point, and, you know, things, I was living in a, this <laughs> really terrible situation, uh, this house, and it was just a really tough time, man, and so um, I was barely making ends meet, and was, like, having to dig through my ashtray to find stuff, you know, money to, to, to eat off the dollar menu, and all of, you know, the struggle, man, because nobody teaches you how to manage money, um, <laughs> and so... Uh, so I go to this judicial community and I'm in there and I just, you know, I was, of course I was in my knots, uh, my stomach was in knots and my parents had heard about it. Um, because I'm pretty sure my sister ratted me out, uh, for something. Uh, they had two witnesses, of course, you know, they always have two witnesses supposedly, unless, it, unless it's about a child abuse, then they don't have two witnesses, you know? <laughs> right. Um, and so, so they, uh, called me the judicial, judicial committee and they're like, Hey, we're, you know, we're here for, for a reason. Um, and, uh, and so I'm like, yeah, yeah, I did that thing. I've also done all of these other things and I don't believe the same way you do. I don't believe that, uh, people that aren't Jehovah's witnesses are bad or innately bad and that are going to die at Armageddon. I don't believe that this group of men in New York city has the right or the authority to make decisions that govern a whole you know, group of 8 million people mm-hmm. and essentially, um, you know, do terrible things like split up families. I don't believe that. I don't. And I just looked him in the face and I was like, I don't really believe in God. So, um, you know, told him all that thing, all those things. And, and so they're like, well, you know, trying to like reason with me and trying to like, you know, judge my heart or whatever. And then it just got to the point where I was like, you know, do what you ha- guys have to do. Cause I don't want to be a Jehovah's witness. And, um, and so, you know, they came back and they disfellowship me and, you know, and even though they say on their website and they say that they don't shun, um, <laughs> they told, they verbatim told me, no, Derek, you know, since you're disfellowshipped, yep. you, um, cannot have any contact with your family or anybody in the congregation. And if anybody in the congregation, uh, including your family, um, try to contact you for, um, for any reason other than you know, something important related to your family, then, you know, they're going to get in trouble. Right. And, um, so from then I was shunned by everybody that was in the congregation and my own family. And, um, it was like a death sentence. So, um, I went to one, I think I went to one, uh, memorial right after I was disfellowshipped. And, um, I remember walking in there and they were sitting in the back and, uh, and I had hurried there after work one night, but, because I felt like it was the right thing to do. And, um, I remember walking in there and just being treated like I was, um, <laughs> I was the, the seven headed beast, you know, that came out of the ocean and it was like, ah, with a, you know, harlot on a <laughs> harlot on my back. Like, um, and, and so I was just treated like, um, like I didn't even exist to these people anymore. And for me, that was the most you know dehumanizing and uh, the saddest thing, one of the saddest things that I've ever experienced. Yeah. Um, and they think that's so, going to bring you back, you know, and, and it, honestly, yeah. it does, it does work at times um, because it people does, react yeah. in different ways. It's but, shame. <laughs> yeah. It, it, because it's, yeah, they feel, people yeah. feel shame or miss their family or whatever. And I get that. Um, yeah. But it's um, for a person who has more maybe healthy tools um, to see that, it's right. like, why would I come back to you? <laughs> you know, you're, right. you're awful. This is, this is terrible. I'm not going to yeah. come back to this. It's just not, right. uh, not, not attractive. Um, yeah. So where did you go from there? What, how'd you oh, rebuild your life? <laughs> uh, that was, yeah, that's quite the, quite the journey. Um, so after that, man, I went into a, like a deep spiral of depression. Um, and I talked a little bit about like, at that point I hadn't really, I, I, you know, been drinking. And so I was introduced to alcohol from my brother from a very young age. So, um, but like, Thanks, so I, Bethel. I, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I had been drinking and, and, um, so shortly after that, like I hopped from job to job. Um, I finally found a job where I paid, it paid actually a really good, a good, um, living in sales, and I was working there and I just, this was right after I was disfellowshipped. So I was just my, my head and my, my heart were in the right place. Um, and 
Um, and so my sister actually worked at the same mall and I would see her like almost every day. And she would, I worked in a kiosk. Um, I worked for cell phone sales. So I was one of those really annoying guys that would like try to <laughs> fish you in with, Oh, you know, what type of phone do you have? Do you want to upgrade? Do you want to add a new line? Blah, 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 blah. You know? <laughs> so, uh, so I'm there in the mall and I'm like, I'm trying to, to, to make a living. And, um, my sister also works there too. And so she would like purposely walk on the other side of the, the mall, um, to avoid me. And, um, she like put out like I didn't exist and I would hear things that she would say about me and like people didn't really understand because they knew she was my sister. They're like, why doesn't you, why does your sister ever talk to you? And so I had to explain everything and people are just really confused. They started hating my sister, even though at one point they're like, Oh, she's a really good person. And they're like, Oh, she's really terrible. Why is she shutting you? Like, you know, and so um, it's hard for normal people to understand because it's not normal. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, unless you kill somebody or unless you like molest a child or something like yeah. that, those are like good reasons not to talk to a family member. Yeah, but like <laughs> it's know, it's so, it's super abnormal. It's yeah, it's not normal. Uh, or you can be estranged from your family, but like you can still like talk to them occasionally. Yes, like, why act don't, like why a don't human. You, yeah. And so like then that, and then my, my mom, you know, for my, my mom, I mean, that's poor thing. So she would try to come to the mall and she would like bring me my mail sometimes and she would write me notes and she would put them on my car and like, like reaching out and saying like, Derek, like, even though I can't talk to you, like, I love you. And, um, she would always like, I hope you're eating and I hope you're getting a lot of rest. And, and oh, you know, I, mean, I hope just, you're eating. <laughs> yeah. You know, man. it's just the and, throwback to how, you know, she always fed everybody. Yeah, man. Like that's, man, if I could have anything in this world, man, <laughs> if I could have anything, just one, like one time I would love to go home um, or just have a meal with my mom and my brother. Yeah. Um, I would, I would literally give nearly anything for that. Um, but so anyway, so my mom, um, my mom would come to the mall and she would like, I would be sitting there talking to a person, um, you know, trying to sell them something and she would come behind me and she would like, like tug on my pants. Uh, and, um, she would, um, you know, try to get my attention. Um, and so I would follow her, uh, because she had to hide to talk to me. So we would go into like JC Penney's or whatever. And, uh, it, like there and we're like having a conversation and I'm hugging her and I'm crying and I'm because, you know, I miss her and, um, she's crying and people are walking through and are like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> 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 and so, um, so yeah, so that was just really hard, man. And, and, um, and then my brother would, uh, like, call me occasionally and he would come in to see my parents and at that point my brother had um had a son and um that's one thing I was really close with my brother and his wife after he he got married and he he married a very um loving uh, she's a Jehovah's Witness as well but very loving woman and um I I really do miss her and I, I miss my brother as well but um so my brother would come into town and he would like send me a text or like we would talk on the phone occasionally like maybe like once a year or whatever. And he would always make promises like, Oh, I'm going to come and see you. I'm going to come and see you. I want to see you. Let's meet up. Like, um, trying to like do it, you know, behind, you know, behind the scenes and it would never happen. Um, I haven't seen my brother in, uh, I saw him once after I was disfellowshipped and that was back in 2008, 2009. Oh, wow. So it's been a decade. Yeah, it's been over a decade. Um, somewhere around, it may have been 2007. Like I said, the timeline's really fuzzy. But um, so, yeah, I saw him. I saw his son once. Uh, I was like, I think his son was probably like a year old or so. Um, and you could just tell, like, my brother and my 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 mom always felt like this guilt and this need to, like, reach out. And, like, something wasn't right. But they were so brainwashed that they're always just like, you know they always get sucked back in. And, you know, one thing that I always respected about my brother was that he was never ashamed of me. And then after I was disfellowshipped, I, I really felt like he was ashamed. Um, and so that was really hard for me to deal with for a while. And, uh, and so like over, over the past, the, the next couple of years, like, um, I got sick in the hospital, 
Um, and my, my mom and my sister found out. And so they show up at the hospital. And at that time I had developed a relationship with, um, a gentleman who I now consider my father. Um, and he, uh, he was there for me. And, um, so I'm in the hospital and there was actually a nurse that worked there that was also a Jehovah's witness that had, um, had left and who is now like openly gay. And, um, and so like, I'm in the hospital and I tell, I tell my father, <clears throat> my father figure, I tell him, I'm like, get a hold of, of, uh, I don't think Jeremy would really mind if I, I used his name. So get a, get a hold of Jeremy. I was like, so Jeremy comes and he's comes in there and he knows I'm sick and he's making sure that I'm getting taken care of. And so he's in the room. Uh, my father figures in the room and then my, my mom and my sister show up and like, <laughs> just Jeremy gets really kind of like awkward and is like, Ugh, I need to go. Um, and then, and so my mom, Oh, my sister are there and I'm like literally connected to an IV. I've got like, you know, I've got painkillers running through my veins. I'm in like the most pain that I've ever been in. And, um, if anybody has ever had gallstones or had issues with their gallbladder, mm. um, yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> no, no but, stones are good. Yeah, yeah. So, um, it was definitely like crippling. So I'm going through that. My mom and sister show up and, and you know, they started, my mom was like, Oh, you know, we miss you. And is using kind of that guilt. We miss you at the meetings and blah, blah, blah. And my, my father figure, he's like, looks at me and, and and he looks at my mom and my sister and is like, and he already knows the story about my sister. Um, and so like he automatically hates my sister, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which one thing I'll have to preface, I'm going to digress this a little bit, but the thing that I can forgive about my sister is like, obviously that something happened to her. Yeah. Um, you and can so have I can some forg- understanding around. Yeah. I can have some understanding there. Um, the thing that I can't forgive is that she manipulated me and she passed me around. And then yeah. later in life, even, even as an adult, um, she manipulated me in certain ways. And then much later, especially I'm pretty sure I'm about 90% sure she had something to do with me being disfellowshipped, which, which essentially she did me a favor, but um, <laughs> right. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure <laughs> right. she ratted me out. So, so like my sister's there and, and I essentially asked him to leave because I'm like, cause my father figure was like, you know, he's really in pain right now. This is not a good time for this. He was very respectful. was like, even though I think he wanted to tear, tear their heads off, but, um, cause he knew what type of emotional damage that I was experiencing. So right. I look at my mom and my sister and it was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do uh, to t- was to tell my mom to leave. And I was like, you know, you don't want to be around for me when I'm, you know, healthy. Why should you be around when I'm sick? So, um, and that was kind of the constant back and forth with my mom and my brother, my sister, I have never, since that day, I've never spoken to her, nor will I ever speak to her again, just because of different reasons. Um, so that was really hard for me. Um, and so I move, uh, after I get better, um, I deal with all that stuff. I, my father figure was like, Hey, um, you know, he experienced some, some emotional issues and stuff. As he grew up, he lost a lot of people in his family that were really close to him that held a, you know, a really, really strong, um, part of his life. And he lost them early and experienced some, some issues himself. So he always encouraged me. He's like, Derek, you really need to go talk to someone. Yeah. But I always like pass it off was like, no, I can handle this on my own. I don't need anybody. Um, and so I ended up moving shortly after I got out of the hospital. I quit my job, my good paying job. I moved, um, <laughs> to, uh, Atlanta, Georgia and followed kind of a pipe dream and just wanted to really just wanted to get out of the area. And so while I'm down there, um, because I, they had to transfer me to a different hospital when I was, when I was there, um, because they couldn't take care of me because I was so most people go in for, in for gallbladder surgery and end up coming out and they're fine. It's like same day surgery for me. Yeah. Um, all in all, I was in the hospital for around 10 days, oh, wow. um, two, two different times. Yeah. So I had the surgery and then after the surgery, I had complications because I had stones that were lodged in different parts. So, um, so anyway, so I, uh, so while I'm in the hospital, uh, when they transfer me to a different hospital, I have them put me on a, like a do not basically like a do not call list. Um, and less, it's approved by me. Uh, you know, I don't want anybody to come to see me. I don't want any phone calls. I just want to get better, especially after that experience with my, with my sister and my mom. And then my brother was blowing up my phone because I told my mom and sister to leave. He's blowing up my phone. So, um, they get me in the hospital They get me transferred. They get me stabilized. I get a phone call from my brother. Um, 
a bunch of when I flip my phone back on, I get a bunch of messages from my brother that are saying like, "Hey, call me, call me, call me, call me." So finally, I, I don't call him. He calls me, and I pick up the phone, and he's basically screaming at me, um, just telling me what a you know a piece of shit I am, and um, that uh, because I because nobody knows where I am. I told my mom and my sister to leave. And finally I just hung up the phone on it was just like, listen, like before I hung up, I was like, I'm sick. I, you know, you guys don't want to be a part of my life. You've made it very, very clear that you don't want to. Yeah, so you don't get to, <laughs> you, you, you don't get a say, you don't get a say in what I do. Yeah. Um, so I kind of left it at that. He and I didn't talk for a while for, for nearly a year. And so then I moved to Atlanta and, um, Moved to Atlanta, and while I'm down there, I get a phone call from him, get him again, saying like, "You move out of the area, you know, you don't tell anybody, you just move." Like, I'm like, once again, you don't have a say in what I do. You don't want to be a part of my life, and so the constant, the common denominator in this whole experience was they always, and I think it's the similar for everybody else who is either disfellowshipped or leaves or whatever, is that you're made to feel like you abandoned them. Yep. Victim and what blaming. I mean, yeah. And so from, from the, from the very beginning, I was always like, no, I, I'm, I'm abandoning a, rel- a religion, not even a religion. I'm abandoning a cult that I, that I don't believe in, that I don't want to be a part of, that it's essentially dangerous. Um, and so that's why I'm leaving and that's why I don't want to be a part of it. So you're choosing not to be a part of my life, not, not the other way around. So, yeah, you just said something a minute ago about your sister and how you wouldn't have anything to do with her. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, so someone could look at that and be like, well, that's not cool. He is he like shunning her? Um, n- no. So your sister actually did stuff to you, lots yeah. of things. And there's yeah. a, a toxicity there. Um, right. you didn't, you know, when it comes to leaving the religion or whatever, if they believe in personal relationships with God or whatever, that's between you and that's between you and God or you and the religion or whatever has nothing to do with them. Um, which is the narcissism of Jehovah's witnesses that they take all of that personally. Um, because they think that like you're doing something to them. You didn't do anything to them. Um, and shunning is an action. It's something that someone does to something else, someone else. It's not, you know, they are shunning you. It's their action. It's what they are doing. It's not right. what you just inherently deserve. That's bull. Um, right. So, you know, th- that's the difference. And that's and that's a thing I, I know, like on your T-shirts and, and stuff like that. Um, you and I kind of chatted yesterday about about silence is violence. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that in this case that that cuts deeper than any knife can. Um, that cuts deeper than than any abuse any um any neglect any uh, brainwashing mm-hmm. i feel like silence cuts deeper than any of that yeah and you know about um, that cuz your dad used it um in man, the family yeah. you know what i'm yeah. saying he would he would yeah. shut down and shut people out that it, it's a it, silence is quite an act um yeah. when you do that to it's, other people it's very powerful i mean you look at you look at the way that different groups do you know peaceful protests i mean sit-ins and stuff like that it's a very powerful statement uh so it can be used for good and it can be used for bad um but in this case you know it definitely anyone who has shunned anyone who experienced this silence is is the it's the purgatory right silence is deafening right (laughs) yeah and uh, can we also just say that um, family blowing up your phone and screaming at you when you're in the hospital is abusive in and of itself. Like Dude. really, you know, screw you, you know, who do you yeah. think you are to go yeah. and, and scream at somebody who's hurting in the hospital? Like that's, that's time and place people, you know, and, and even then don't scream, just have a conversation. Right. Like I can understand being like frustrated, but like my brother was literally screaming at me. Yeah, That's ridiculous. And I was just basically like, dude, fuck you. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I yeah. Mean, because, you know, and so, you know, I'm in the, in the hospital. I'm literally like at one point the doctor said that had I waited any longer or whatever, that I probably would have fought for my life he said out of thousands of gallbladders that he's taken out he said that mine was like the absolute worst he's ever seen so wow. he said if anything if if i had waited like a, a day longer that he said i probably would have fought for my life because there was so much infection and stuff like that so um 
so yeah, so I'm trying to get better in the hospital. I've got these nurses coming in, I'm on oxygen, I'm on like, and, and so, you know, and then I have to deal with that. Not only that, but I was in a really toxic, like personal relationship with this girl. So on top of that, it was terrible because I was experienced. She was so selfish. It was a completely toxic relationship. Anyway, I'm not even get into that. Uh, <laughs> but, but so and so one of the same things with her was like she knew where I was at. She didn't respect my father figure because he was like, dude, this girl's not good for you. <laughs> <laughs> and so essentially I wasted like four years of my life with this girl. But yeah, I learned a lot about myself and I learned a lot about it. It wasn't completely her fault. I mean, I was had a lot of emotional issues. I had a lot of emotional issues i had abandonment issues i had um a lot of different things so it wasn't fair to her completely but we just weren't good for each other so not only was i dealing with my family but i was dealing with her so like i was like i don't want to be contacted by anybody i just want to get better so i get out of the hospital um and i am um you know i move down south and and i'm like working all the time working like 70 hours a week um and uh I'm, you know, having a good time at, at the time, but I'm also just really, really depressed. And, um, and so I was tired of working like either sales jobs or like food industry jobs and stuff. So I lived there for about nine months and, um, and I decided to move back. I talked to my father figure and, and I was like, Hey man, I was like, I just, I want to go back to school. I want to, you know, I want to better myself. Um, and so he's like, we'll move back. He's like, we'll figure out how to make it work. And, um, and so I moved back here. I'm like, 26 years old um you know not a pot to piss in <laughs> and uh and so I moved back home briefly and while I'm here um I'm in southeast Ohio like I uh or why I'm there excuse me um I start like trying to figure out where I'm gonna go to school and what I'm gonna do and so um and then in the meantime I hear about my sister telling people that I'm an apostate, which I had been very vocal and I am an apostate and I will continue to, to be an apostate because <laughs> I wear that badge. I wear that badge with honor. Yeah. And, um, because I'm going to talk, I'm very much a freedom fighter. I'm definitely justice seeking when I feel like any type of group is, um, you know, dehumanized is marginalized is, um, you know, is discriminated against is, uh, oppressed. I'm going to fight for those people because I know what it's like to be, a, to be a victim, but that's not who we are. Uh, take your, take your strength back. You know, and once you start processing through those things and you start dealing with them and you find a support system, you can really, um, you can really do some, make some, some, some ground. Mm -hmm. And so, so in the meantime, like, my sister calls me an apostate, uh, I hear it through, uh, a mutual, uh, a friend, He's like one of my best friends growing up. Um, he was never baptized, uh, but his cousin is married to my sister. And so I hear about her calling me apostate. So when I got baptized, my sister bought me a Bible with the reasoning book in the back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and with the leather. It was a really nice Bible. I mean, yeah. so um, and so she bought me that. And she also gave me a letter, letter right after I was disfellowship saying about how she loves me and cares about me and blah, 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 all this happy go lucky stuff and, you know, cult mind control psycho babble. Um, and so she, uh, she gave me this letter. So I walked into the place where she was working at the mall and I was like, I'm going to take some of my power back. And so I walk in there and she's with, uh, she's not with a customer or anything. So I walk in and I put the Bible right in front of her and the letter was inside the Bible. And I look at her and I go, um, you know, I was like, you and I share one thing. Um, we only share blood. And obviously that doesn't matter to you. Um, I was like, I think you need this Bible more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> and that was kind of a nod at, you know, you know what you've done. You, you yeah. know who you are as a person. Um, you know, we don't share a belief system anymore. We don't share any of that anymore. The only thing we do have in common is blood and it's not, it doesn't matter to you. Yeah. So, you know, take this, take your Bible back, take this letter back. And I mean, I just wash my hands of you. And I remember just saying, like, I didn't say goodbye. I just, I remember her just crying and running into the back of the room, you know? And, and, uh, it was like my way of saying, you know, this is Fuck done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's closure. Yeah so, yeah. so um so I leave. I end up moving um to about two hours from 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 where my hometown is and going to college. While I'm in college, I learn a lot about myself. I struggle a lot. 
um, I start really um, trying to understand um, what I experienced, process those things. But while I'm in school, you know, I always had this, like anybody, any, anytime somebody wants to talk to me about like Christianity at that time, I'm like really, really bitter. And I'm like, I don't want to talk about religion. I know more about religion than you do. Like I know my Bible, blah, 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 <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so I'm very like combative. And so one of the requirements when I was doing my coursework for my bachelor's degree was I had to take a religion class. And so I take this religion class on, um, the Abrahamic religion. So Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And, um, and while I'm in this class, this professor is just like, or she's, she's like average, average build or whatever. And she has like this like platinum white hair and she comes in and she starts talking to us about, you know, what we're going to be doing in the course. And the one thing that I really appreciated about her is like, she grew up as a Quaker. Um, and she, uh, has obviously has education. Um, and so, but she also inc incorporated, um, different belief systems. So we talked a lot about indigenous people, especially about like the plains Indians, um, or not Indians, I'm sorry, the plains, uh, native Americans, mm -hmm. um, that, uh, and about their belief system and about their journey, their spiritual journey. And so she's tying that all in and saying, Hey, even though we're all different, even though these, these religions are all different, we all, uh, have a yearning for understanding of things that we don't necessarily understand and also like trying to figure out where we belong in the universe and how that relates to, you know, godliness or how that relates to, you know, how we perceive the things around us. So, so we have to write these different papers. And, um, so I start writing about, she wants us to write about our own spiritual journey. Uh, and so I start writing about, about that. And so she starts writing at the bottom of these papers, like really thought provoking things and kind of like questioning my stance on things. And she could tell I was a little bitter. And so I take some notice and I'm like, Oh, like she's like interested in what I'm, you know, what I'm saying and, and what I'm writing. So I want to have a conversation with her. And so after class, I, I, I go up to her and I, I, I start talking to her about, about, um, you know, my experience and stuff and come to find out her dad was a, uh, was a park ranger and he was over the park, um, uh, in dinosaur Colorado where, <laughs> where we used to live close to where we used to live and where I, um, I went to like kindergarten and stuff. And oh, really? uh, it's just a small world, really small world. Yeah. And so, um, so then she starts talking to me about, about Christianity and I tell her about my experience and I, she can tell I'm really bitter. And I remember like just talking about doctrine and talking about all these things that I don't agree with and how, you know, Christianity is toxic and blah, 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 blah. And, and she looks at me and she's like, Derek, she's like, have you ever thought that maybe you weren't taught true Christianity? And at that moment, no one had ever, ever asked me that before. And, um, and it we really like stopped. We had true Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you think you have a really good, accurate understanding of the Bible and you know your way around it and stuff. And and um, it wasn't until that point where somebody really like shook my tree per se and said like, you know, you weren't taught true Christianity because she's telling me and she remember her telling me because she's like, that's not the same God I believe in. You know, she's like, that's not the same Jesus that I believe in. And, and, and that's that's not what I believe. And she's like, so. So, yeah, so it was at that point where I was in school and, you know, she really started questioning. I started questioning myself and how I perceive religion and belief and all this stuff. And and so I kind of go on my own spiritual journey. And so <clears throat> I'm working at this restaurant. I'm um, I'm really having a hard time making ends meet, um, taking a full course load and you know trying to make car payments and trying to pay rent and trying to do all these things. And um, and I'm really struggling. So I'm in a really negative space. And I'm also trying to deal with all of, I ended my relationship with that one girl I was telling you about. And so at that point, I'm just really, really low. And so at that time, my father figure is like, Hey, um, you really should go talk to somebody. Yeah. <laughs> so I start going and I start talking to someone and I start working through the depression and the anxiety and the, um, you know, PTSD. And those are things that, that, I mean, for me, I was like PTSD, you always, you know, assume that somebody with PTSD is either, either served in the military or been in like a war zone or something like that. But no, I mean, it's, it's, it's real and yep. there are triggers. And, and so I start working through those things and then, you know, we start working through the attention issues. So there were so many different things that I'm working through. Um, 
And, and so, you know, while I'm there, I'm, I'm talking about my history and I'm completely transparent and open about what I experienced and, um, the things that I felt and, you know, if anybody's going to be an advocate for mental health, um, I think that anyone, whether you had a great life growing up, I think anyone can can really benefit from going and talking to a counselor and learning how to deal with everyday stress or doing dealing with insecurities or whatever. So, you know, I'm working through all these different things and um, and then I'm, I'm still working in school. So I'm getting closer to graduation and I meet this girl that I work with and she's really into like um, yoga and into like the, the healing properties of stones and stuff like that. And I remember starting a shift with her and it was like one of the pivotal moments that really kind of put me down the, the, the course, uh, to like seeking positivity and, you know, finding my own journey. And we start this shift together and she's like, Hey Derek, I, I'm look, want to go to California. I want to go to this yoga school so I can be a certified yoga instructor. Um, I really need, need to make some money, but on the other part of that, like, I want you to wear this quartz crystal cause quartz is for positivity. And so I wear this stone and, um, we end the shift and I'm just like, we had a good time. And it was like her and I really worked really well together and we had a good time during our shift. And then she moved to California and she did what she was going to said she was going to do. But she, at the end of that shift, she was like, I want you to keep that. She's like, cause I feel like you need it. And she didn't know what was going on in my life. She mm-hmm. didn't know. And she's like, I think you need that. And I still have it uh, to this day. And so at that point I started really seeking positivity and, and seeking like, what, what can I do? what can I do to, um, if I'm not okay on the inside, um, then I can't really be in a relationship with someone else. I can't look to try to help other people if I'm not good on the inside. So started working on myself and also just trying to do random acts of kindness for people and trying to pay it forward and, and really think, you know, positively because you're, perception is your reality. So, you know, whatever you're putting out there, you're going to get back. Um, and so I do that. I go to this music festival, which really changed my life too. I went to this four day music festival with some friends, some really close friends and saw some really emotionally. I've always loved music. Um, and so I listened to some really emotionally charged music that got me through those really low times. Was it literally and- emo? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, mean, I just wondering. <laughs> some of it, I mean, I listened to a lot of I listened to a lot of different stuff back then. I probably was in a lot of hardcore stuff, so yeah, I was really angry. Yeah. But I'm not angry anymore, so <laughs> so I started listening to like some happier music. Yeah, and, music's um, great. Yeah, like John Butler Trio. Um, there's a piece of of music by John Butler Trio. It's uh, it's all acoustic. Uh, it's called Ocean. Uh, literally, every time he plays it, uh, he plays it differently. Um, and it's a really, it's about a 10 piece, depending on how he plays it. It's about a 10, 10 minute piece of music. Um, but really go out there and look for that because it really helped me. It's kind of, um, it builds. And anyway, so I got to see that piece of music and I got to see, um, some, some other artists that I really, really like appreciated. And so while I was there, it was very much, I'm like, I'm sweating. I'm like, we're, we're probably malnourished. Um, I experienced it sober, um, with the exception of a little bit of drinking, but experienced it sober and there's all these people around you and they're like doing psychedelics and stuff and it sounds terrible but it it was very much a a a community um you you're camping next to people you're like taking like military showers like dumping gallons of water over your head and like you know trying to make do with what you have um and everybody's sharing and everybody is like helping if you fall people pick you up like community literally so yeah it's very much a community and what community should be so that kind of piggybacked off of what I was feeling already was like, Hey, a sense of belonging, a sense of positivity. Like we all are as humans, we all are all a community and, you know, we're the most disconnected, um, or we're the most connected as far as technology goes, but we're the most disconnected sure. from our neighbors. Um, so, so yeah, so I go to this music festival, I start thinking positively, um, meet some really great people. And then shortly after that, like I wasn't looking for someone, I wasn't looking for, to be in a relationship. And, um, I, one of my best friends, um, uh, got married and I was the best man in his wedding. Um, and I met my wife at his wedding. Um, and, uh, she was a bridesmaid in the wedding. And, um, 
literally met her at this wedding and we had a good time. We danced and, um, I drank way too much and had a good time, but, uh, but she, uh, we talked ever since and we've been together ever since. And it wasn't until I think, uh, coming out of the toxic relationship that I was in before and working through all of those things, um, had I been in a different mind space, I would have never like appreciated her. I I would have never uh, felt like I was worthy of, of love. Um, and, um, she really changed my perspective and her and her family, um, really changed my perspective on, uh, how I view, uh, Christianity and how I view, um, just religion in general, even though I still consider myself agnostic, mm -hmm. um, uh, borderline atheist. I, I appreciate people's belief systems. I think faith does a really powerful thing for a lot of people, good things for people. Um, and so I start to understand her belief system and her, her grandfather was a pastor and, uh, he was a pastor, a Methodist pastor, but he was also very versed in, in the world's religions. And he always encouraged his, um, my, my wife's uh, mother, um, and the rest of her siblings to really um, take in as much as you can. And just because you have one belief system doesn't mean you can't appreciate something from another belief system. So he really studied a lot on Buddhism and a lot on, um, on other, you know, religions and stuff. And so he incorporated all of those things into his own belief uh, of Jesus and his own belief of, of religion. And so, um, and it wasn't until, you know, through, throughout, um, you know, being, you know, leaving, uh, being uh, disfellowshipped as well as my journey, I have experienced love from unconditional love from so many different people that are not, that don't have any type of, um, shared belief system that don't have, that aren't blood, um, that have really taken me and, uh, you know, at times said, Hey, come and celebrate the holidays with us. You don't have anywhere to go. Like come here. Um, you know, my, my father figure, him and his family were the, like, you know, just open arms, uh, to me and for the holidays. And I'd never experienced a Christmas before. And, um, it was the, you know, strangers that completely opened me up to Christmas and the holidays and Thanksgiving and what it is to be a normal family. <laughs> and they, you know, they argue, they argue, they fight, they complain, they bicker and stuff, but, um, they always made me feel welcome. And I really think that you can really judge uh, the heart of of people by how they treat a complete stranger. And um, and I've been the recipient of that love and that generosity on so many times that, um, you know, I'm very thankful for that. So, you know, I meet my wife um, and her and I start dating and we start talking about all these different belief systems. And I completely pour my my heart out to my to my wife about about my experience and about what had happened to me. And this is like one of the first pe persons that I really, um, you know, just laid everything out on the table. Um, and one thing I will say too, it wasn't just limited to my sister and then the other groups of, of females. Um, there was a positive, uh, figure in my life, um, that a male figure that also took advantage of me and groomed me and also, um, he also did a lot of really great, great things for me, but he also, uh, sexually abused me as well. So, um, so I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, uh, I'm, you know, I poured that, I, she was like one of the first per she was the first person I ever told about that. Yeah. Um, and she didn't judge me and she just, she just was just awestruck because she was just really confused because she grew up in a very wholesome <laughs> environment where, you know, she was protected and, and her parents, you know, did everything for her and her sister. And I mean, just did a really great job in raising, you know, their daughters. And, um, and so she was really frustrated that these people would, um, the people that were sp supposed to be there for me just completely abandoned me, uh, abused me, um, neglecting me and you know all of the <laughs> terrible things but uh so and she made me feel okay and there have been people you know throughout the past that i've talked to that i've shared little things here and there with and and you know the more you talk about it and one thing that i one thing i do want to stress is if you have experienced any form of um you know you know depression or you know anxiety abuse neglect trauma um 
you know, if you've, you've experienced any of those things, whatever's happened in your life that's traumatic, um, there is, there are people out there that will listen to you and that will, will love you and that will, um, be supportive of you, uh, that aren't in your family arrangement or are, are not those people that have shunned you. And so sometimes it seems really, really bleak, uh, and that there's, you know, you're at the spot at the bottom of, you know, of a hole and you can't get out, but there is somebody there and life is worth living. And, um, you know, humanity is beautiful. You know, our, our, um, our propensity for, for compassion and, and love and empathy far outweighs the, the bad things. So, uh, there are support systems out like this support system that you've got going on, um, as well as other, uh, groups, uh, that you can be a part of. So, yeah, yeah, you don't have so, to go it alone. Yeah, that's in a nutshell. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. Um, you don't have to go in alone. There are people out there that that will love you. Um, <laughs> and it doesn't may not seem like it, but even sh- more stronger than your own family. Um, oh, there are yeah. people out there. I yeah. feel like it's those bonds uh, that are stronger. You know, they say the blood is thicker than water. That that's not the case. No, <laughs> the no, case. no, no. There's some, uh, uh, no. yeah. <laughs> yeah. some views the family is put yeah. on a pedestal as something, right. um, that is very sanitized and is not necessarily what it usually is. So, I mean, yeah, in the perfect world, that's the way it should be, but sure. it, it's not the, the not reality. reality of it. No. And, yeah. No. So, so yeah, so I go to school. Um, I finish a graduate. I meet my wife. Uh, we move in together. Um, we, uh, get married, um, and, you know, she's my best friend and her family are, they're, they're wonderful humans. They've, um, I really, I remember being like sad and and down and out and thinking like, I just want a normal family to belong to. (laughs) And, uh, and so I found my wife's family, they're fantastic people. They're so wholesome, uh, in their own ways. And, um, they are, (laughs) <laughs> the quintessential like what is what a family should be and you know some people are like oh that sounds boring no that's for somebody who comes out of a group that we come out of a cult like we want normal <laughs> yeah well, you want stable and something that's not volatile <laughs> yeah um, all the and, time. Uh, absolutely and then my father figure his family too so and i have you know my friends that were in our wedding uh all my bet all my uh my groomsmen um you know, they're on our invitations and stuff. We put that, I put that they were my brothers because each one of them, um, played a key pivotal role in my life, um, in helping me along the way. And if it wasn't, if it weren't for them and it weren't for the, the generosity of complete strangers, um, and if it wasn't, wasn't for them, then I, I don't, I wouldn't be here. Uh, I wouldn't be in the place that I am today. I wouldn't be in a wholesome relationship with who I'm, you know, with my wife. Um, I wouldn't have gotten, been able to, to get through school and I would have no self-worth. Uh, and it's those people that, um, deserve a thank you. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so let me, it sounds like you've got this, this beautiful new life. Um, do you yeah, have man. any dreams, anything that you're looking forward to going forward? Absolutely. We have, uh, we have a young son. Um, he just turned like 14 months, um, just, uh, the beginning of this month. Um, he's wonderful. He's, he's a very kind, compassionate. He's very, um, he's very interested in, uh, in all things. Um, he likes puzzles and, uh, he likes doing things with his hands, but he's very cautious. It's really, it's really fun to watch, watch, um, the little person grow and see what things they're interested in and, And, um, he's, you know, he's the, you know, the light of our life and, you know, being a parent is very challenging, um, in certain things, but it's also, it's the most rewarding thing that I think that I'll ever, I'll ever do. And one of, you know, one of the things that that I have to look forward to is that he will be able to experience things that I wasn't able to experience. If he wants to row crew or if he wants to take art classes or he wants to, you know, he wants to belong to a club in school. Um, he can do those things. And, um, and then he's also not going to experience things, things that I did. Um, I don't, I want him to know one of the things that scares me the most is sending him over to somebody's house for a sleepover. Um, but that's a fear that I'm going to have to get over, but, you know, educating him to know like, Hey, it's so it's okay to, um, 
to come forward with things. It's okay to not, don't be ashamed, you know? And also if somebody also teaching him what it means to be in a safe place. And that means like if somebody touches you in, in, in a certain area, um, that's not okay. Uh, you know, if it's, you know, even if it's a family member, even if somebody's close, if you don't feel okay about it, um, you know, or if somebody's even made you to feel like it's okay, you need to come forward and you need to talk about those things. It's so, um, that, that's, and that's just about being a uh, good parents, not punching holes in walls, not threatening right. <laughs> to leave all the time and creating a space where a child feels safe. Uh, you know, so that they actually exactly. know what it's supposed to look like, you know, you know, so that they can see a contrast when, yeah. when home sucks and home isn't safe. Yeah. If you're out somewhere else and it's not safe, well, I mean, what's the difference? Right. <laughs> you know, um, you have to create a, an environment for a child. Absolutely. Um, that, that is healthy for them. Um, it sounds like you're on your way to doing that. So do you have yeah. any, um, do you have any, particular goals for yourself um or you and your wife have anything that you're working toward yeah we um you know obviously raising our son and, and, and raising him in, in a healthy environment um and then you know we want to buy a house soon um and i mean our careers are really important to us as well um uh so she's you know she's a, she's actually in the mental health field um and so she uh she's really passionate about what she does helping, um, especially mothers with, um, maternal mental health, um, after they've had a, had a child yep. or children. Um, and me, I work for a really great company. Um, I'll retire from this company. So our, you know, our careers are important to us, but family is important to us more than anything. So, you know, sharing, uh, memories with, with family, going on vacations, uh, going to parks, um, traveling as much as we can, um, and just investing in each other. That's one of the most important things that we can do. Um, possibly continue my education at some point, maybe getting a master's degree in something. Um, and then, uh, I would also like to, um, you know, be in a position where I can also help others as well that have experienced, you know, either similar, you know, similar things to, to what I have or, you know, other things. So, um, one thing that's really important to me is, is what you're doing, Michael, and, and being an advocate and, um, and being, uh, you know, um, involved in, in this community. Cause I feel like it's, it definitely is getting out there, but you know, it definitely needs more light needs to be sh shined on this organization, on this cult and opening it up to, um, you know, scrutiny, more scrutiny. So, and by telling your story, you just did that. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate you giving me a platform to do that. Um, I appreciate, uh, that, more than more than you know so you know listening to i want to thank all of the other participants in um, not only in the podcast that I, this podcast but also on youtube um mm -hmm. and i want to thank them for sharing their stories because without your stories i wouldn't have done what 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 i just did so um you know they deserve a thank you and they deserve a, a nod and uh, you are strong you are um you know you're valued so your stories matter and they continue to help people and they've helped me as always, I want to thank everybody that's brave enough to get on here and tell their story uh, so that they can help those that listen. And And I hope that in listening back to it, you get a different perspective and can give a little more weight to what you experienced and, and find some more healing. If you're listening, you can support today's guest by leaving a comment of support on the website at shunpodcast.com on the episodes page. While there, you can find the date for the next Shun Recovery Project online meetup. Reach out for one-on-one -on -one coaching to get moving on your new life or buy some merch and rep the show. Visit my other site, xjwhelp.com, for helpful videos and a downloadable roadmap of life after leaving, as well as resources like meetups, books, and a lot more. Join the Facebook support group called Shun Podcast. Find us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and more as Shun Podcast. Leave a review on iTunes or other podcast apps for both this and the original podcast, This JW Life. Uh, so that more people can find these stories and get the help that they need. Donating equals loving. So if you love these stories and find them helpful, please support the show at patreon.com slash shunned. And there's some rewards there, and it, and it really means a lot to me to, to see that people support what I'm doing, and it helps me to do more. The theme song for today is No Hell Yet by Fair Voyeur. 
And as I end all episodes, love others, do no harm, and go be happy. We're a curse God.